as Martin's already mentioned, we're looking tonight at Nehemiah. And our reading is the first chapter of the book. This is where we're introduced to Nehemiah. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. In the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and the gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, O oh Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favour in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. Many years ago, there was a famous preacher by the name of C.H. Spurgeon, Charles Hatton Spurgeon. He was a great preacher and a great character as well. And one of my favorite stories about Spurgeon is that one time he was leading a prayer meeting and uh, one man was dominating the prayer meeting, monopolizing by praying on and on and on and no one else was being given a chance to pray. So Spurgeon being the character he was, he stood up and he announced to the congregation, while our brother continues his prayer, we will sing together. And he announced the hymn uh, so that uh, everybody else could take part and not just have this one man uh, praying and dominating all of the time and monopolizing the, the whole of the gathering. And it can be annoying, can't it, in church or in a prayer meeting when some people pray so long that you lose your concentration and uh, uh, you, you, you're thinking, when are they going to end? Or when am I going to have the opportunity to say something to the Lord that others can amen to? And so I also like this little quote of Spurgeon where he says, If a church is to be what it ought to be for the purposes of God, we must train it in the holy art of prayer. And that's what we're doing on our, our services this autumn. We've been looking in the mornings at different parts of prayer and in the evening at the lives of some of the great people of prayer so that we might be informed, instructed and inspired to be people of prayer who are more effective in our praying and in our prayer life. We've looked at Jesus, that's where we started. He's going to be the, the greatest person of prayer ever. Uh, the Son of God knows how to talk to his Father, doesn't he? 
So we looked at Jesus, we looked at Moses, we looked at Daniel, and tonight, in a moment, we're going to look at Nehemiah. But as we do so, I just want us to remember also this teaching of Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 6, uh, verses 7 and 8, Jesus says, When you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. And one of the things that stands out for me in the prayer life of Nehemiah is the brevity of his prayers. He prayed often, he prayed continually, but from the book of Nehemiah it seems he was often praying very short, simple, swift <coughs> prayers rather than having to spend a, a, a long time in prayer. And I want to share this tonight because I think it might free some people from that almost guilt that some Christians have put on us that you've got to be, if you're going to be a person of prayer, you'll be on your knees for hours. You know, you'll be up late at night or early in the morning uh, and you'll be praying for hours on end. Well, Nehemiah's example is you don't necessarily have to be praying for hours on end when you can pray multiple little prayers throughout the day as you go about your business. In the Old Testament, there were two great men of God who lived at the same time who worked together closely. One was Ezra, the priest, and the other was Nehemiah, who in some ways was a politician. And uh, Ezra was one of those people who knew doctrine and teaching, and I get the impression Ezra was one of those people who would have prayed long prayers. If you were in a meeting with Ezra, uh, I, I get that impression from reading his book that if he, if he was praying, he would have been taking his time. But when I read the book of Nehemiah, the impression I get is of somebody who kept his prayers short, brief, and simple. He was a busy man. He didn't have time to devote hours every day to prayer, but he did pray every day and throughout the day. Uh, and that's what I want to encourage us to do as Christians. Nehemiah, in the book of Nehemiah, uh, it refers to him praying 14 times. And the longest prayer that is recorded in the book of Nehemiah is here in chapter 1, and it only took me one and a half minutes to read it. So the longest recorded prayer of Nehemiah was one and a half minutes long. And yet it tells us in that same chapter 1 that he prayed for many days, fasting and praying and seeking God. And he would have done that as he went about his very important business as the cupbearer of the king. As you analyse Nehemiah's prayers, and I don't know if you've ever done this, but it's, it's worth doing. His longest prayer is in chapter 1, one and a half minutes. There are two curses, which we'll talk about another time. Okay, and there uh, is one big prayer meeting that he shares in with everybody else, and there are ten other prayers, and these other prayers are all little, brief, quick prayers, as he needs them throughout the day. The Bible is teaching us something here that's well worth learning. I hope this is helpful. You don't have to pray long prayers to be effective. So let's look tonight at Nehemiah's prayers. And the first thing I want us to notice is that Nehemiah's prayers were often short prayers. There's a great example in the very next chapter, in Nehemiah chapter 2. Nehemiah tells us he was the cupbearer to the king. And that was a very important position. Uh, it, it was basically the food tester. He would have to test the wine and the food before it went to the king to make sure the king wasn't being poisoned. So he was like the king's right-hand man, the king's advisor, the king's trusted uh, uh, companion. And Nehemiah held this, this job and he did it well and the king trusted him and respected him. But he goes to work one day and he's upset. And he's been praying for, for, for months. For, for actually 30 days 
from chapter 1. Uh, if you've, you've got your Bible then, you want to quickly look it up. From the, the month of Kislev, the 20th, uh, to the month of Nisan, 30 days he's been coming before God and asking God's wisdom so that he can do something to help the people of Israel. Because the city is still in ruins. They've been back from exile now nearly a hundred years. The temple is built, but the city is in ruins. The nation is needing uh, renewal. And Nehemiah, his heart is breaking when his brothers come and tell him how bad things are in Jerusalem. And he's praying for God to bless his nation. And uh, he goes before the king and he's upset. And the king notices that he's crying. So he says to Nehemiah, why are you upset? And if you've got your Bibles, have a little look what happens next. As Nehemiah, in chapter 2, and in verse 4, it says this. The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king. If it pleases the king, let, him, let me go to Jerusalem to help rebuild the city. Okay, that was his request. But notice this, that the king asks him what you want, and he prays before he answers. Now, how long do you think he kept the king waiting? Do you think, you know, he, he, he said, I'll come back in half an hour after I've prayed? How long do you think he kept the king waiting? It would have been a very quick prayer, wouldn't it? It would have been, oh, give me the right words. And, and straight in. And this is what you see right through the book of Nehemiah. That he wasn't somebody who always had the time or the opportunity to spend uh, 15 minutes, half an hour, an hour uh, in prayer. So he would pray these quick, brief, short prayers before God. Because it's not... How long you pray that matters. It's the heart reaching out to God. And as he told the king his heart, the king responded positively to Nehemiah's heart and to Nehemiah's prayers. And he is released to go back from uh, Susa, which is now in modern day Iran, uh, and go all the way back to Jerusalem to help rebuild the city. And uh, I love the fact that the Bible teaches us from Nehemiah's example that you don't have to pray long prayers. Do you remember the old style services where they'd have the long prayer? How many of you have suffered through a Baptist service long prayer? I remember when I was young, I would time them sometimes because I knew if the prayer was long, we'd be there even longer for the preaching. And I remember being in one long prayer, it was 20 minutes in the long prayer as the preacher decided that he would pray for everything he could think of that night. And he went to, around the world, you know, with all of the different situations that he could think of. And he was 20 minutes praying. Guess how long he preached? 40 minutes. And that was without all the hymns and the other the bits of the service. And I, I, I remember thinking when God called me to be a pastor, because as some people were falling asleep in the long prayer. You know, you close your eyes that long, you're gone, aren't you? Especially if the, the building's warm. Have you ever suffered in this way, or is it only me who suffered uh, in the old-fashioned long prayers? I remember God saying to me, Martin, if you're ever a pastor, don't make people into a long prayers. Long preaching is different. But long prayers, don't make, uh, don't make people do that. Brief prayers in public. If you want to pray long, Pray long prayers in private. If you're in a church and there's a prayer meeting and it's open prayers, keep your prayers brief. So that everybody has a chance to pray. <coughs> Let the, the prayers be sprinkled through the service rather than one big long lump all in together. 
You see, it's the depth of the heart, not the length of the words that matter to God. Is this setting someone free tonight? Taking away that sense that some people have given us that if you can't pray for an hour and a half that you're not a real Christian? Nehemiah didn't need to pray for an hour and a half. Half a second moved the king. I remember some years ago reading a book, and it's a good book, The Hour That Changes the World by Dick Eastman. And uh, it, it's good because it talks about all the different facets of prayer uh, as we're doing on Sunday mornings. You know, praise, thanks, confession, meditation, uh, all of these things. So we're looking at that on Sunday morning. And when you read that, you hear about John Wesley and the hours that he spent in prayer and other people. And the first people who recommended this book to me recommended that I spend an hour in prayer every day. But, you know, I struggled. I didn't have an hour every day to give to prayer. What I found was, while it was useful to know all these different things of praying scripture and waiting on the Lord and intercession and petition and worshipping God through song and listening to God and learning how to do all those different parts of prayer, it was better for me if I did lots of little prayers throughout the day rather than one big hour all together. And then all of a sudden the verse of scripture started to make sense. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Pray continually. When I first read that, I was confused. I can't pray continually. I've got stuff to do. There are other people that I need to have conversations with. How do, how do we pray continually? What does the Bible mean? And it means live a life of prayer. Pray throughout the day. Don't ever think there's any time that you can't pray. Does it make sense? Uh, and Nehemiah is a great example of this. Because as you go through his book, you see 10 short, simple, swift prayers. So the first thing I want us to note about Nehemiah is that he prayed short prayers. The second thing I want us to notice is that his prayers were often swift. He prayed when he needed to pray. He didn't say, well, I'll wait until I go to bed tonight before I pray about this. If something came up, he prayed about it there and then. And he didn't mind if other people were there. Sometimes he'd pray for them. And other times he'd pray aloud and he'd let them hear him praying. He prayed straight away and so should we whenever, wherever there is a need to pray. Let's not wait till later. So Nehemiah returned to Jerusalem. The walls were broken down. The city was in a discouraged and a dispirited position. And he examines the walls and then he calls the people together and he inspires them and encourages them to start rebuilding the walls. And as they're doing this work of God, what happens? Enemies start surfacing criticizing, discouraging, finding fault, mocking. Recognize this. If you're doing what God wants you to do, there'll be somebody who'll try to stop you. So what did Nehemiah do? When he had these critics, have a little look at his book. Have a look at Nehemiah chapter 4 and verses 4 and 5. When Sanballat and Tobiah are saying, oh, these walls of a fox climbed up and they fall down. <clears throat> Nehemiah turns to God. And there's just a two-verse little prayer in the middle of the story. And you get the impression that he prayed it out loud there and then. Hear us, O our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or plot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. He prayed and did spiritual warfare there and then. And he encouraged others to pray too. As you go on in chapter 4, you see that as they were building the wall and the, the nations around were plotting against them, it says in verses 8 and 9, they all plotted, the, the Arabs, the Samaritans, the, uh, uh, the, the others, nations that were around about, they all plotted against them. 
to come up and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Notice the we prayed. Sometimes you need other people to pray for you and pray with you. And one of the ways we can do this quickly and easily is send in a request to the prayer chain or go over to the prayer corner or when we have times of prayer ministry not be afraid to pray for the person sitting next to you in church if somebody in church comes and says to you before the service i've had a horrible day put your hand on their shoulder and pray for them there and then for god's relief from their stress and their problems and their worries if you're out and about in the shops and one of your friends says to you, my husband or my wife is in hospital, stop and pray for them just a sentence prayer there and then. When we were downtown with, with Elvis on Saturday, I prayed with somebody in the street, just a short prayer. Often when I'm at the, the door after the service on a Sunday morning, on a Sunday night, and people are coming out and they're telling me some of the problems there and then, I will pray with them. Because it isn't the length of prayer that makes a difference, it is the genuineness of the prayer. And we can see God bring healing, we can see God bring <coughs> transformation to a whole host of situations if we'll stop thinking we've got to pray for half an hour about this before God will do anything. <coughs> Doesn't necessarily need that much time. Oh, there is a time to keep asking, seeking, and knocking. But let's start with the brief prayers, with the, the short prayers, with the swift prayers. What we, you, you can see it again in, in chapter 6, verse 9, where Nehemiah prays just a sentence in his spiritual battles and struggles. He says about his enemies, they were trying to frighten us, thinking their hands would get too work, weak for the work of the Lord. But I pray, now strengthen my hands. Four words. That's all he prayed. Now strengthen my hands. Four words. And God strengthened his hand and the work continued. And the wall was built. We used to call these when I was a child, arrow prayers. Do you hear that phrase? Our prayers needn't be long for God to listen. Arrow prayers, short but heartfelt, get his attention to. Arrow prayers because you can fire them off at any place at any time. Other people call them bullet prayers. Not because they're shooting a gun, but because they can be like bullet points. You know, just give God the problem. Give God the situation. Ask God to help. Uh, uh, maybe uh, in our modern day, we need to call them rocket prayers because they'll get there quickly. And they'll make a difference when they, get, when they reach there. When you've got time, it's not wrong to take longer in prayer. But the length of the prayer doesn't matter. I'm sure if Nehemiah had the time, he would have prayed a longer prayer. But here it was very simply in chapter 6 and verse 9. Now strengthen my hands. Wow! It's a great example, isn't it? I'm freeing somebody here from that thought of, uh, I'm not as spiritual as somebody else. Somebody else, I, I heard, uh, you know, they spend a, a morning in prayer or uh, they get up early for an hour of prayer in the morning and uh, uh, there's nothing wrong with that, okay? If God calls you to do that, there are prayer warriors who God lays that burden on them to pray intensely with length and with depth. But for many of us, that might not be our calling. Ezra, I think, had that calling. Nehemiah, lots of little prayers, conversing with God through the day. Prayer is just talking with our Heavenly Father. The third thing I want us to notice about his prayers, not only were they short and they were swift, but they were often very simple. His prayers were, were answered. We were praying down in John Street with somebody. His prayers was simple. So the building work went on as God answered the short, swift, simple 
prayers of Nehemiah. As that building work went on, his enemies intensified their opposition. He lived with constant criticism and intimidation from Sambalat and Tobiah and Geshem, the Arab. But he continued to pray these short, swift, simple prayers. Ezra would have got the theology right, because Ezra was a priest and uh, knew his scriptures. Nehemiah was the politician. He hadn't had that depth of, of instruction and teaching. So his prayers were very simple. What he did was, he gave things over to God. Put it in God's hands and left it there with faith. So in Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse 14, he says, Remember Tobiah and Sambalat, oh my God, because of what they've done. Remember the prophet Esnodiah and the rest of the prophets who've been trying to intimidate me. Lord, I know if you're going to remember, you'll sort it out. And I don't have to remember, I can get on with what I'm doing. Do you, you understand that? He's giving it over to God, isn't he? He said, Lord, I'm giving it to you to sort out. I'm trusting that you're going to be working. Even when I can't see it, you'll be working. You remember, you, you, Lord, keep this on your mind until it's sorted. And that word remember is one of the features of Nehemiah's prayer. And in the very last chapter of the book of Nehemiah, uh, as they, they went on, they built the, the temple and uh, the walls and uh, the walls of Nehemiah, uh, the, the ruins are still there. This is, this is history, okay? The archaeology is still there. You know I love my archaeology, but I'm not going to do much on it tonight, okay? Another time. I want us to keep focusing on this, that Nehemiah kept saying to God, remember. Remember me for this, Lord. Oh my God, and show mercy to me according to your great love. What's he saying? Lord, I want to be famous? No. It's Lord, remember the work that I'm doing is your work and give me help and strength to see it through. That's what he's saying there with remember. And four times in the last chapter, he talks to God, remember, in the very last time, remember me with favor. Uh, and in the, the Hebrew, that can be translated with grace. Remember me, Lord, with your mercy, with your forgiveness, with your blessing. I'm seeking to do your work. I need your help. I'm dependent upon you. Lord, uh, but every one of those, those remember prayers in that last chapter, only a sentence. Because sometimes that's all it needs. Will you give your problems over to God? Will you give your struggles, and your burdens? You don't have to pray with great depth and theological uh, precision when you can pray like Nehemiah. Simple, swift, short prayers to your Heavenly Father, telling Him when you feel that need to, that you need His help and He will hear. I want to encourage you to be people who will pray out prayers like that. And uh, in a, a little while later in our service, after our next song, we'll have an opportunity for open prayer. And when we have open prayer, what do I say? Are you going to pray aloud? Amen. Pray aloud? Or also I want to say, if you're going to pray aloud in a prayer meeting in the church, don't pray too long. Yeah. Wouldn't it be lovely if we had ten prayers of a few sentences each? rather than just one or two people praying for five minutes. If God has blessed you, be a blessing to others. And one of the ways we do that is prayer. One of the charities that my wife and I support is Christians Against Poverty. And in one of their latest testimonies, it talks about a woman called Amanda. And uh, Amanda says, when my mum was diagnosed with cancer, I stopped work to care for her. And the bills started to mount up. I wasn't spending on luxuries. It was just the cost of living, council tax, rent, my phone and so on. My gas and electricity bills doubled and they'll go up again soon. It became too much. When you feel overwhelmed, you stop thinking straight. I was sinking into depression. One day in January, it was cold and snowing, a bailiff knocked on the door demanding money. I took an overdose that night. I just couldn't see a way out. 
And then she contacted Christians Against Poverty. Christians came alongside her, helped her to sort out her finances, started praying for her, started encouraging her to trust in Jesus. She started going to church. She gave her life to the Lord. Her life was transformed. And right in the middle of this testimony, she says this, I pray you can help someone in debt today, just like I was helped. Because at my darkest time, hope arrived. And I was just struck by that, just one sentence. I pray, and one sentence. What would be your one sentence prayer to God tonight? Can you think of one sentence that you would ask God to do? Has he blessed you in some way that you want him to bless others? Lord, you've saved me, saved my family. Lord, you've healed me, healed that relative who's in hospital. Lord, you've given me guidance, give guidance to that person who is seeking wisdom. It only needs to be short prayers. And God honors, answers, does great things. When like Nehemiah, his people come to him with regular prayers of that kind. So before we sing and have an open time of prayer, let's just spend some time reflecting. And I want you to reflect on a question this evening. If a prayer's length does not matter, what does matter? What makes a good prayer? If a prayer's length does not matter, what does matter? Does anyone want to comment or Is respond? Just a prayer? Iris, let me bring you the microphone so that everyone can hear. The substance of the prayer. Yes, it's what's in the prayer, not the length of it. Does anyone else want to comment or respond? Makes a good prayer. I think the sincerity of the prayer. The sincerity of the prayer. Anybody else want to comment a question? Maggie. Knowing that God hears it and he knew before you even spoke it. Yes. Jesus said. Matthew 6, you don't have to pray long prayers because your Father knows what you need even before you ask. Anyone else? Liz. Yeah, praying it in the name of Jesus. Like your favourite teacher does. <laughs> Martin, that's you. Praying in the name of Jesus as I've been teaching in line with his teaching, his example, his will. Anyone else want to respond to the message this evening? Does it make sense? Anyone got any question? Want to uh, ask for clarity? I'm going to ask our worship team to come back and lead us in a song. At the end of this song, uh, we'll, we'll sit back uh, quietly and we'll have an open time of prayer. And as the Lord leads, let's take time to come before him with our prayers. So pray aloud, pray loud, but you don't have to pray long. Just give God what's on your heart.